PCC bodies. How many of you have been affected by Dad? Uh, he was your Sunday school teacher. Uh, he drove you in his big Chrysler and packed it all in. Uh, some of you are his patients. We love taking care of you. We'd be happy to know that you're doing good at oral hygiene. <laughs> some of you know Dad by being friends. Dad had incredible social graces and always tried to make you feel welcome. So I hope you feel welcome here this morning. Uh, as uh, our family, uh, again, we want to thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to invite Pastor Lee to come up and open our service uh, with a time of prayer. So, Pastor Lee. <coughs> Eternal God, we come before you this morning to celebrate our brother, Dr. Us, going back to heavenly home. We are so grateful that you gave Dr. Us to us for his caring as a loving brother and his dedication in this church as an elder. Even in the suffering and pain during the last several years, we knew him accepted with a grateful heart. Thank you, Lord, for molding his spiritual life and give us a good example of a Christian work. For we know he has fought a good fight. He has finished the course, and he has kept the faith. Father, we ask for your comfort upon Dr. Ha's family. Even we know your promise and assurance. Even we know we will meet him again before you. Yet as we say goodbye to him, we still miss him. So help us now to wait upon you with a believing heart. May your words speak to us that we might have hope and be lifted up above darkness. We ask for your protection and blessing upon our children and generation to come. Because you have promised for those who love you and obey your words, your blessing will be thousand generations. So may you protect their faith that this family will have more godly men and women continue to serve you in your church. So we leave out this service in your hand and may your name be glorified. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. If you look at your program uh, a little bit closer, um, you'll see that the songs that we chosen are Dad's favorites. Um, you might have heard the prelude coming in, Claire de Lune was one of Dad's favorite songs, we asked Abby to play it this morning. Uh, later, there's not just a little bit of food, there's a lot of food. This is what Dad would have wanted. <laughs> and really, I want us to really walk out saying, you know what, that man has impacted our lives. So something we don't normally do, but I'd like to try this morning is, why don't we just greet each other and welcome each other? We're so focused just looking ahead, but why don't we just take a moment and welcome your neighbor? That's something Dad would have wanted us to do. So why don't you just say hello to your neighbor? <laughs>
Um, I'm going to invite Julie and Libby come forward to lead us uh, in our songs. <coughs> Oh, 
no longer live for themselves, but for he who died and rose again on their behalf. This is Dad's life. My name is Gary. I'm number two son of William E. Ott. Each of us gathered here today has been touched in some way by my father. You have known him as a dentist, as a church elder, church councilman, friend, a relative, a mentor, a father, and a husband. This is a man that God raised up, called to himself, used greatly, and also blessed greatly. Dad saw, God uh, saw fit to give Dad more than 85 years of life. But it is the life that was infused into those years that we celebrate and thankfully recall today. Dad was born just before the crash of 1929 into the close-knit Toysan community in Pittsburgh. It's not that the Toysan immigrants at the time had a big stock in, the, uh, in Wall Street. <laughs> but together, they faced the economic challenges and the burdens of that time. This led to tight bonds within the families that depended on each other for social, financial, and spiritual needs. My dad's father was a laundryman, and dad would help out in the laundry, he told me, until late at night, and then after that, he had the privilege of doing his homework. I think there's a lesson for us somewhere in that. <laughs> and Dad remarked to me once as we drove by his old laundry site on 9th Avenue downtown near the old Roosevelt Hotel, where there's a parking lot now. He said, that's where the laundry was where I spent most of my teen years. And it was set down under the sidewalk so that the windows would just see people's feet. And Dad said, you know, I got tired of looking at people. <laughs> and from then on, Dad always wanted the view property. He wanted big windows if you've been to our house. He wanted the big view. And as kids, we kind of understood why he would haggle with the uh, poor guy at the Motel 6 in Cleveland to get the highest floor just to see the parking lot. <laughs> but Dad's father, my yeah, yeah, was an uncompromising man, and like many of his age, stressed education. That was the key to getting ahead in life. And for this reason, my yeah, yeah, my grandfather, was proud of Dad. Dad won the Buell uh, Science Fair Award in high school for building a remote control glider. And he also graduated valedictorian on Fifth Avenue. And he was very proud of that, my grandfather was. Dad went on to attend the University of Pittsburgh on a half academic and half athletic track scholarship. And and the thing that you wouldn't anticipate. Imagine the Chinese pole. <laughs> but Dad was truly a pioneer, not only in that way, but also because it was unusual at the time for Chinese to go on to university. And that was uh, his dream to do that. But it's a sign of the times that maybe we can't relate to as well. That Dad, his dream, he told me, was to become a medical doctor. But he was intimidated by his classmates uh, because they told him no Chinese could do that. And it seems funny to us today because in this room, I don't think you can count the Chinese doctors. <laughs> but at that time, it was uh, quite a thing to push forward. But Dad applied to dental school and learned the vocation that would define his professional life and begin a career that God would use to touch many lives, many of you here. While a student at Pitt, Dad accepted an invitation from a perky young nursing student who is now sitting in the front row, <laughs> to attend a gospel meeting at camp. And on several levels, we see now that this was surely an appointment from the hand of God. This was a fire and brimstone type meeting, Dad told me, where he was a little, a little bit afraid. But through it, Dad met his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and received Christ Jesus with fear, holy fear and love. He chose to serve his Lord for the rest of his days. And you in this room are witness of this. The sweet aroma of service to God would be a part of Dad right up to this day. Of course, the other person in this divine appointment would be the love of his life, Lydia Lee, who had invited him to the meeting. Dad once told me that he had had his eye on this lovely young lady for years before and used to invent excuses to go up to Sun Fong Yen, which was the dry goods store where Mom grew up grew up where the Toysan people would congregate so he could kind of check her out. <laughs> but Dad would be the first one to tell you that he married up. 
and I think uh, uh, we have enjoyed that. This remarkable team, William and Lydia, has been a blessing in some way to every person in this room, especially to we kids at home, although we didn't always see it that way. <laughs> but we could see Dad's love and their love for each other through the ritual of the day to day. Although Dad was raised in a home without a mother and father together, he was again a pioneer and modeled a godly family that he had never seen, but that Mom and Dad built together by God's grace. So Dad fulfilled his ROTC requirement in the early 50s and reported to Langley Air Force Base down in Norfolk, Virginia after finishing his dental school with Mom. And we're reminded again of the challenges that this generation faced because when he got there, he told me that uh, they had a latrine uh, and it was marked colored at this end and white at that end. And uh, he looked at himself, hmm, where do I fit in here? <laughs> so he asked his CO, his commanding officer, what how the solution to this. And the CO said, well, you're ROTC second lieutenant or, and officer, so you can use the white side. <laughs> and that kind of told us where he stood. If he was enlisted, he would be asked to use the other end. So uh, we see that Dad uh, made inroads even in this place. And in the 1950s, uh, Dad struck out into the wilderness that was then North Pittsburgh where no Chinese had yet dared to tread. <laughs> and he chose to live in North Park and started a true, literal mom and pop operation, a dental practice in Pines Plaza, just a mile down the road here. And dad surely entered the high rent district then, back in the arcade, because to get to the office, you walk past the watchmaker, then Virgil, the shoe repair guy, then Al, the barber, and after that, William Ott, dentist. That's how he got to his place. And my Uncle Al tells a story that even as they prepared the office, that mom's brothers and sisters came up from sons and snuck past the white night watchmen with their ladders and paintbrushes to get the place ready for dad. So it was truly a labor of love for the family to start this practice. Mom and pop was surely the appropriate word for this place because Glenn, my older brother, uh, was born at that time, and mom had to step back from being the assistant, receptionist, janitor, and all the things she had to do. <laughs> but God's provision again came just in time, because dad was recommended a young teenager from the next door drugstore, Sun Drugs, who was looking for a job. Harriet was her name. She became his receptionist and assistant for the next 57 years, and many of you know her well. She continues to work in the office today. And we understand now that the dental practice was blessed and blossomed, mainly because patients come to see Harriet and not necessarily now. <laughs> but Dad took pride in his work and certainly worked very hard. We saw that. A typical day, many of you know, was 9 to 5 on a weekday, followed by dinner at home, and then a nap from 6 to 7, in which silence was strictly enforced by Mom. No piano practice, phone ringing, loud noises running around because dad needed his rest. The routine was that mom would prepare his coffee when we woke him up and he would come by the table, take the coffee, and mom uh, would go out in the cold before this and start the car so it would be warm for dad when he came out. And I'm still working on Cheryl to do that for me. <laughs> But Dad would then work from 7 to 11 at night on weekdays. And Friday night was special because he would pick up pizza on the way home, and we kids always look forward to that. Dad made a commitment to missionaries and many full-time workers, as you know, with his dental work, extending his generosity to them with his dental care. What they didn't know was that this meant you come after the paying customers. So after 11 p.m., Dad frequently, with Mom and other help he could raise, would be there till 1, 2 in the morning doing gratis work into the evening. This was his sacrifice of love. But this hardworking and comfortable life would again be invigorated and God would revisit in a powerful way. As Gordon mentioned, in 1982, Greg Al Young came. And he spoke at our retreat. And Mom and Dad decided at that time to begin annual short-term missions using Dad's dental skills to reach people for Christ. This adventure they had together led them to Taiwan, the Congo, Zaire, Honduras, the Philippines, many times to China, and friends around the world to this day. It's interesting because prior to this time, 
Dad wouldn't go anywhere that wasn't air conditioned. <laughs> to see him work was really something. And as you know, Mom didn't go for seafood, but she ate snakes out in Africa. <laughs> and it truly changed them. And I could see the difference in the lives of them and the richness that came to our family because of this commitment. These were not vacations. When I had the privilege to go with them once to Chengdu, and I was doing heart surgery, and Dad was running the clinic, I knew where the emphasis lay because the car would come around and pick up Dad in the morning and I would ride him on the back of a grad student's bike. <laughs> At midnight one time, having finished one of the cases, the patient was still bleeding, I went to find mom and just so we could pray together for the patient, expecting them to be getting ready for bed around midnight. And I got to their little apartment at the campus compound, and it was full of dental students with dad giving a animated lecture on the temporal mandibular joint, and they were listening to him. So dad worked really hard, and he enjoyed that. The story will be told well at the upcoming 50th anniversary of Pittsburgh Chinese Church, but this was one of Dad's passions. As a founding member of the Pittsburgh Chinese Church in the early 60s, I watched Dad and Mom together begin the routine that would maintain and build this young church. <clears throat> this involved driving separate cars, the two of them, around the city to pick up restaurant and laundry kits from the south side, the west end, the north side, uh, making multiple trips before and after church. Fruit from this labor is sitting in this room today. Dad encouraged each pastor in turn, shepherding the church through many transitions. He collected grad students and co-workers to maintain a schedule of youth fellowship meetings, college meetings, council meetings, junior youth fellowship meetings, elder meetings that often stretched into the night. The constant feature though was donuts. <laughs> that would bring the donuts. If you recall the uh, 4th of July picnics we had, Dad's biggest fear of those the, was that we would run out of food. And when it looked a little low and the kids looked hungry, Dad would say, double everything. Or you know, he'd disappear for a few minutes and show up with a car full of buckets of KFC. That was our favorite. <laughs> no summer retreat was complete without Dad leaping over the bonfire at the end. Uh, those of you who have heard Dad sing may be surprised to know that he was once in the choir. <laughs> he wanted to sing To Be God's People, the song that we uh, iterated just now. But they gave him a bass part because he was a bass and that was not the melody and he couldn't get that so he gave that up. But there was a song in his heart and he loved music in that way. God, uh, Dad frequently worked behind the scenes at church to smooth over disputes and handle things that no one else knew about because his greatest joy was to see brothers dwell together in unity and to see the name of Christ lifted up through the church. I know we worked hard to keep good relations with the hosts of our church frequently we were using other properties. This involved interaction with the Salvation Army downtown, First Presbyterian Church, the Christian Missionary Alliance, Perrysville Church, and finally being involved in the sale of this very building and the purchase of Espy School, where Glenn and I went to uh, elementary school. Dad stood right here at this spot at the dedication of this building. And this is what he said in his writing. I think it's true of him. God has given us special encouragement through his servants. Through their ministry and faithfulness within their own lives, God speaks to us and helps us grow in our faith. God's kingdom is being extended, especially to Chinese, through faithful and dedicated servants. Red letters, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That was Dad. If you knew Dad, you would know that he had very little downtime. He was a busy guy. Sometimes he found energy for tennis three times a week. <laughs> Tuesday night, Thursday night, Sunday morning before church, we used to meet in the afternoons. Dad would be playing tennis and giving it his all. He had friends from the community, from all races, and his tennis friends all called him Doc. Doc this, Doc that. He didn't start playing until age 35, but it's a measure of his tenacity that he taught himself to play at a high enough level to play sanctioned tournaments. Now this meant a lot to him, and you have to understand how this works. When you're young, the age groups go 16, 18, and you, the lower age groups are less skilled. When you go 45, 50, 55, 60, 
you get to play with the old men. That is as much as, how do I provide for you? And he did that. Each time he left to go to work, he would give mom a kiss and a hug and call her his young lady. We kids would watch them. Mom and dad hold hands together and walk together. Even after his stroke laid him low 11 years ago, and mom waited on him hand and foot, he was sure to tell us kids, make sure to buy your mom a birthday present, Valentine's. It was convenient because mom's birthday is on Valentine's. <laughs> <laughs> and always a Mother's Day box of chocolates and a card. He couldn't do it himself, but these were tokens of a lifetime of love. Dad also loved us kids. He was overjoyed with Glenn and Tanira and his first grandchild, Carlene. He cherished his great-grandsons, Luke and Logan. And we, concerned, we could see the prayerful concern he had for Glenn through Glenn's long and difficult <coughs> illness and the pain on his face when the reports would come back with something that favored, but he loved Glenn. Dad is also proud of Gordon. Not only for following in his shoes as a dentist and going to Pitt, but the legacy of his practice, which he built over decades of dedication and hard work. God gave Dad the blessing of being able to pass that into Gordon's dedicated and skilled stewardship. But God had surely worked the blessing, that God had surely blessed the work of his hands. We also saw the measure of Dad's heart on 9-11. Grayson, my youngest brother, had a wedding scheduled for several days after 9-11 in Seattle. And as you recall, all the airlines were grounded. But Dad, very uncharacteristically, got right into battle out at the airport and fought every day to get the first plane tickets out to go to Seattle. This meant so much to him for the family to be together. When I struggled, during my first weeks as an intern, I felt a lot of dad's pride in wanting me to succeed. But as I was sure I couldn't. After a week, I hadn't slept and I was failing at everything. People were yelling at me and I was sure I couldn't do it. I thought I should stop my words. And I called dad in tears, just like now, and asked him to pray for me. And dad was willing to drive all night just to be with me. He said, that I had gone far beyond the point where he could materially help me with my work. But he was willing just to sit and pray with me and bear my burden with me. He wrote me a letter. And I'd like to read a little bit of it to you. I keep it in my office to this day. I know if you commit yourself and your burdens to God, that God will be faithful to provide for your needs and give you strength for today and tomorrow. This is Dad's writing to me. These last words are from my favorite hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, so we got that right. <laughs> Which we sung just two Sundays ago in church. Every time I sing these words, I am reminded of God's faithfulness in so many difficult times in my own life. My heart swells and I have tears in my eyes as I remember those times. I know, Gary, you are undergoing one of these difficult times in your life. And I pray you would really consecrate your life to God and commit your problems to our Lord. Allow the Holy Spirit to fill your heart, give you peace no matter what happens. Then he quotes Lamentations. Just the end, I'll quote again. His compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I long to be with you not only to accompany you, but to help you in your struggle. That's the heart of my dad. Dad taught us by example how to be a husband, a father, provider, and man of God. Even as he lay trapped in his broken body, Dad still led us in family prayer and said to us, Indeed, great is God's faithfulness. Dad's testimony in life is witness to the admonition of the Apostle Paul. Therefore, brethren, be steadfast, immovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil in Him is not in vain. Dad's work stands before us as we continue to serve God. Dad now sees his Lord face to face. You see, death is a defeated foe. Death is swallowed up in victory. Dad has gone home to rest in the arms of his Savior. We will see him again, righteous before God, standing in white. I'm convinced that Dad's life has been a testimony to his love for Jesus. And I know at that time, God will hear these words from his Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord.
Maybe that came from pole vaulting. <laughs> but he was willing to take risks. And the foundation of that was he knew that God was faithful, that God was just, that God would see him through these things. Dr. Rock could have boasted about a lot. Again, his education, career, family, his service to others. But I never heard him boast about those things. He was proud of them, and we could see that. We knew that. It was obvious. The way he spoke of his family. <clears throat> but his boast was in Jesus Christ and who Christ was to him. How merciful and how compassionate he had been. I enjoyed my brief visits with him. He always gave me a fist bump when I came in. Gordon shared the other day that Dr. Rod had a way of making you feel good about yourself. That fist bump meant more to me than anywhere else he could speak. He told me I was okay and things would be okay. The greatest area of concern for Dr. I was his church. As I visited him, he would, being the financial guru that he was, he would always give me the update for the stock market. <laughs> I don't know why. It was a pastoral visit, a visit from a friend, but he would always give me that stock market update. He would always warn me about spending, be frugal. Watch. <laughs> Things can change. But the greatest area of concern with him when I visited was really the spiritual well-being of the congregation. Always asking how the people were. And his advice was always the same. Never new advice. The same advice. He didn't speak to me about the church programs. He didn't speak to me about church management. He didn't even speak to me about things like evangelism, although I know that was on his heart. He told me to emphasize to the people in the congregation the need to have the Holy Spirit within them, the need to have Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. He knew that the key to being a successful person and a good Christian was to be submissive to God. He appreciated the wonderful gift that God had given him. The scripture today just says, I, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The idea here spoken by the prophet is not that he wanted God just to be a small part of his life, just a small portion. The idea is that God is the one who sustains us and nourishes us. Without Him, without that portion, we're empty, we're incomplete. Psalms tells us that we should.
Lydia, on behalf of the President of the United States, the Department of the U.S. Air Force, and a very grateful nation, I present this flag to you for your husband's dedicated and selfless service to this great nation. My deepest condolences to you and all your family during this time. Thank you. It's an honor, ma'am. Hear stories from the family. What is what is evident is the grace of God that was abundantly poured out into his life, and the hope in the richness of eternity of his Father for all of eternity. And in light of that, I'd like to close our time with a passage from Romans chapter 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and belief, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Dear Gracious Holy Father, we thank you that you are the God of all hope. We thank you that you have abundantly poured your grace in our lives. And, and we thank you particularly for the grace of God that leads us to salvation, the salvation that we see evident in, in Bill's life, a salvation that he's now enjoying and glorying and beholding the face of Jesus. We thank you for the, just the testimony of your grace in his life. And, and Lord Jesus, we just thank you for the grace of God that flowed through Bill's life, that we got to experience his kindness, his love, his generosity, his service, his tender care. And we thank you for your grace to flow through his life. And that just encouraged us and how many come to faith in Christ through the work of, of Bill's life. And we thank you. And with this, Lord, we pray for your comfort. I pray for your comfort to be abundantly poured upon the Ott family. I pray for those that have lost a husband, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, an uncle, a mentor, a friend, that you would greatly comfort us in the midst of our grief. And we thank you for the great hope that you are the God of all comfort and that you abundantly pour your grace, you abundantly pour your love upon us, in, upon us in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would do this. And Lord, as we go forth from here, we pray that you would strengthen us with your grace to abound in hope. Hope not in for what this world has to offer or all these other things, but hope in the eternity that Bill is now enjoying. Hope in the rich pleasure of enjoying your presence for all of eternity. Thank you for the testimony of grace in this life. And Lord, now as we transition to our time of lunch together, as we get to just continue to enjoy memories of Bill, continue to reflect on your grace that was abundantly poured into his life, we pray that you would bless the food that we're about to take. We pray that you bless our time of fellowship, that you bless our time to encourage and maybe even grieve with one another just as we share memories. I pray that you bless this time, bless this food, don't I? And you might appreciate it, do pray. Amen. Amen.